there'll be some people joining us as they can. Welcome everyone uh, to our Wednesday, February 15th edition of Grand Rounds. Um, to start, uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge that our nation's capital is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived on this territory for millennia, and we honor them and this land. And their culture and their presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. CHIO also honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their valuable past, present and future contributions to this land. I'd like to highlight that one of our presenters is actually currently in, um, in Nunavut at this time. Um, and so as well, a uh, tribute to um, our colleagues and our friends uh, in Nunavut. So uh, presenters today, I'm thrilled to present to you um, some of our amazing PGY3 residents. So we have uh, Dr. Victoria Griffiths, Dr. Rachel Howard, Dr. Stephanie Lim Reinders, Dr. Sujan Saravabanan, and Dr. Chansey Vaynut. And uh, these residents all have an interest in teaching and in education, and they enjoy working with children and learning through various styles and methods and have been amazing contributors each um, in their own way to our program. We've been very lucky to have them and very excited to see them as they're all progressing onto the next stage of their educational um, and clinical practice journey. So the title of today's presentation is Factor Fiction, Understanding Misinformation in Medicine. I will leave you to our speakers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Odsend, for that introduction. Um, so once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our Grand Rounds presentation today. Um, my name is Rachel Howard. I'm one of the R3s here at CHEO. Um, we'll be presenting with uh, Victoria, Stephanie, and Sujin today. Um, we would also like to mention that our presentation um, was made with the help of our co-resident, Chansey Vino, um, who due to unforeseen circumstances, unfortunately, is not able to join us this morning. So next slide. So in terms of our learning objectives today, we're going to try to define misinformation and then understand how it is spread, appreciate the scope and the impact of misinformation in society and in medicine, as well as providing examples of misinformation with a specific lens on PEDS, and then try to go through some evidence-based strategies for how we can navigate misinformation in our clinical lives. So to start us off and to provide a little bit of the framework for some of the terminology we'll be discussing, we are currently living in a time that has been coined as an infodemic or an information epidemic. Essentially what this means is that living in the digital age, we now all have access to an overabundance of information. Some is accurate, some is not, and it can make it really hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when those are needed. Next slide. There are several models that exist um, that try to frame how we sort of define this false and harmful information that we have access to, or colloquially what we all may refer to as fake news. This is a commonly cited model that was created by a group called First Draft, which is an international not-for-profit coalition. And it outlines sort of the core and overlapping concepts of both falseness and intent to harm, which have a relationship to all of these definitions. On the left-hand side, you can see the term misinformation. So this is false information, but it's often something that's spread in good faith and without the intent to cause harm to others. In direct contrast, on the other side, on the right, you see the term malinformation. This is actually true content that is spread purely with the intent to cause harm to someone. So an example would be you know, leaked celebrity photos to potentially cause career damage. And then in the middle lies disinformation, which is false news that um, both has falseness to it and also has that intention to harm others when it's spread. Next slide. UNICEF has also created a framework for how we define this really challenging subject, um, and they've identified seven key categories at sort of various points on a harm scale. So on the least harmful end on the left hand side would be examples of information we have access to through things like parody or satire, so late night comedy shows that may, you know, show a very clearly altered tweet for comedic purposes. Or perhaps it would be news articles where you see a very catchy title, but then the substance of the article doesn't really match what you're reading. 
On the far end of the spectrum, on the most harmful end, on the other hand, we have um, examples such as manipulated content. So content that is commonly referred to as a deep fake or something that has been completely altered from its original message um, or completely fabricated or false content from the get go. Next slide. Governments around the world right now are trying to work on campaigns to help better equip their citizens with being able to recognize and navigate um, false and harmful information online. Um, this is an example that we found of an infographic that was made a few years ago in the US by a group called the International Federation of Library Associations. But in essence, they kind of outline a few key points. So um, false or harmful information that we see online tends to often come from sources that cannot be verified if you tried to. They tend to have highly emotive, confrontational, or controversial appeal to them. So really a uh, appeal to individuals' you know, inner bias that they may be not aware of. Um, they tend to take strong stances on complex issues. Um, and then they can be really, really difficult to find cross verification for. So moving on to some more concrete examples now, we know that false and harmful information has really existed since time immemorial. In the last century, um, a lot of the terminology that would have been used, especially if it was coming from government sources, would have been the term propaganda for completely false information. Um, and this would be considered amongst one of the more harmful forms of of um, false information. On the left hand side here, we can see example of a children's propaganda book that was written and distributed actually by the Nazi government in the 1930s and widely disseminated in German grade schools. The book equated Jewish individuals in society as being poisonous mushrooms. So individuals who were responsible for basically all of the problems that um, folks living in Germany and around the world were experiencing. On the right hand side, we have an example from the 1980s of something that was termed Operation Infection. So this was actually a Soviet propaganda campaign that essentially purported that the HIV virus um, was something that was entirely created by the American government um, as part of sort of biological weapon research as a means for potential fewer, um, future bio warfare with the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, we are also all aware that these are not simply historical examples and information that's been spread by propaganda even decades ago um, is something that are still believed by a proportion of individuals in society today. Next slide. On the smaller scale in Canadian politics, we can see examples across our political spectrum. So on the left hand side, we have a tweet example from two weeks ago. This is the current CPC leader, Pierre Polyev claiming that the Liberal Health Minister would plan on extending made availability to patients with mental illness who have active suicidal ideation, despite her clearly stating in Parliament earlier that day that active suicidal ideation would disqualify individuals from being considered for made. On the right hand side, we see an example from the Liberty, uh, Liberal um, Deputy Prime Minister Krista Freeland. Um, this is a tweet that she put out during the 2021 federal election campaign, claiming that then Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole wanted to move to a fully private health care system and was in support of this, despite him clearly stating that he was open to exploring some private options, but that he would never get rid of public coverage for Canadians. In terms of what people might see in their own social media feeds or on the news or on their drive of work, there are other examples that obviously would come to mind for everyone. On the left hand side here, we have an image of large billboards that were actually placed all around downtown Toronto about four years ago by a prominent Canadian anti-vaccine group. And the billboards simply stated, how many is too many? Who decides? Educate before you vaccinate. These billboards were ultimately taken down after being up for two weeks due to pretty significant public outcry by the citizens of Toronto, as well as a court order for their removal as the content was deemed to be false, misleading, and dangerous. 
On the right-hand slide, we have a product from Gwyneth Paltrow's infamous company, Goop. This is the jade egg. So this is something that was purported um, to treat various um, female health issues, including uterine prolapse, urinary incontinence, and hormonal imbalances. Um, claims that actually ultimately led to her company being successfully sued by the government of California for spreading false and misleading health information to citizens of that state. And then lastly, we kind of have an example of misinformation in the digital age and in the age of AI in particular. So on the left, we have an original image of Emma Gonzalez. This is a Parkland school shooting survivor um, who's seen tearing up a shooting range target in an act of protest for the lack of any strong firearm legislation in many of the American states. On the right hand side, we can see a digitally altered image that has been spread through various social media platforms since the original was released. Um, and you can see that the target has actually been replaced with the American Constitution. I think that everyone here can appreciate that AI manipulated content in this case is concerning for several factors. Um, one, because it involves an individual under the age of 18, um, but also that it has um, the potential to have very serious safety implications for the individual in question. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Stephanie, to discuss the context in COVID. Thanks, Rachel. I'll, um... <clears throat> be building on some of the examples that Rachel shared and dig into the medical sphere. So I think one of the biggest examples that comes to mind for all of us with misinformation in medicine is the COVID-19 pandemic. I cannot drive home enough how dangerous this has been to public health for two reasons. One is the volume and scope of misinformation and the other is the consequence because people really believe it. In terms of how much misinformation is out there, an estimated 25% of tweets contain true misinformation on Twitter, and there's an additional 17% that's unverifiable. The big question is always, so what if a quarter of these tweets are frankly incorrect? And the truth is because people believe it. The volume of misinformation really matters. Half the world is using social media. Facebook has 3 billion users. Twitter has half a billion people using it. And the reality, is that increased exposure to misinformation leads to increased belief that misinformation is true. One clear example is that exposure to online misinformation about the COVID vaccine was shown to reduce intent to vaccinate by almost 10%. To take it further, exposure to misinformation not only increased belief in that misinformation and prompted misinformed behaviors, but it also decreased evidence-based behaviors. One example is during the early pandemic, the more you believe that garlic would protect you from COVID, the less you believe that you needed to protect yourself through social distancing and masking. So if an estimated quarter of the information is frankly false, it has enormous consequences for the scope of people who are going to be exposed. In early COVID, a study came out that there was an estimated 6,000 hospitalizations and 800 deaths in the first three months of 2020. <clears throat> Sorry, this is pre-vaccine era. It's not the number of people who got COVID from being worried about vaccine safety or efficacy. It's the people who were directly harmed trying to prevent COVID by drinking bleach and methanol. These images are all pictures from the World Health Organization. The dates are too small to read, uh, but all date between April and May 2020. It was almost impossible to keep up with how quickly this misinformation was coming out and how quickly people were believing it as well. As silly as we thought some of these suggestions might be, um, like eating garlic to cure COVID or drinking Lysol or injecting Lysol as had been suggested, I want to drive home that people really believed it and people got hurt. As Rachel discussed, misinformation is not new and its impact is not limited to COVID. I'll start with substance use, mostly vaping, tobacco, marijuana. Prior to the pandemic had the highest rates of misinformation online according to multiple studies that preceded the pandemic. Often cited were health benefits to marijuana, downplaying how harmful cigarettes and tobacco and especially vaping can be. And I think it's worth noting that there's huge industry involvement linked to substance use. A lot of these posts had original ties to industry or links to sales to some of these substances. 
an estimated 87% of total tweets contain misinformation, um, of total posts, sorry, contain misinformation, and an estimated 41% of tweets. The next, and one that shocked me most, was around cancer therapy. 30% of social media articles contained, frankly, harmful information about cancer therapies, and 39% of Americans believe that alternate medicine, alternative medicine alone can cure cancer. That was horrifying to me. There's a huge fad dieting industry that contains loads of misinformation. One that particularly targets vulnerable teens are the online anorexia communities, which can reinforce eating disorder identities and share dangerous weight loss, weight loss methods. This list here doesn't contain all the other ways teens are targeted with other online communities and sharing things like the Tide Pod Challenge. It also doesn't include the other pieces around vaccines originating with the MMR vaccine and continuing all the way through the COVID vaccine. <clears throat> I want to reinforce that there's broader societal implications when people are afraid and when there's misinformation and includes a risk of violence as well. Historically, we saw this through HIV and AIDS. During the SARS outbreak, we saw a huge amount of stigma against the Asian population as well. We all saw it during COVID, during the trucker protest, how angry and emboldened that group became. Plus all the terrible slurs and all the violence against the Asian population worldwide during COVID. It, uh, during Ebola, misinformation was directly linked to violence within communities and specifically against healthcare providers as well. Fear does terrible things to society. And the connection to misinformation is that people, it reinforces fear and, uh, and gives people specific things to be afraid of like healthcare providers and specific populations. I just wanna to touch on how this misinformation is spreading online. The general public get a huge portion of their health information online from both things that come across their social media page and what they actively seek out when they have a health related question. People are using Google, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, mobile apps, and all of these have different and varying rates of misinformation. In terms of where it comes from, there's often a very vested original source that can be traced back to the start. In the highly partisan political sphere, it comes from one side or the other of the aisle or from a particularly strong lobby group with a very vested financial interest. In the health world, there's also often a party with financial gain to make. This is especially well documented in the nicotine and marijuana industry pre-pandemic. It's important to highlight that major news outlets as well play an important part in both the start and spread of misinformation through things like clickbait titles and and helping to start a discussion around topics that are viral as well in the mainstream media. Another big piece is gossip, fiction, stories that are attention grabbing and spread. Once started for all the reasons that Rachel shared, it's captivating, it's emotional, it reinforces bias, it often spreads faster than true information online. <clears throat> it spreads very quickly. And interestingly, it rarely spreads only by person to person sharing. So usually there's an element of an online algorithmic tool that generates the viral spread. We'll talk about the online factors with how some of the, something becomes viral. And then I'll hand over to Sujin, who's gonna talk about the demographic of who shares this information. There's often multiple factors at play. And it's important to remember that the impact is huge. The overall health literacy of the general population is low and it's becoming harder and harder to discern what might be fake news. From the online sphere, the factors that are involved in the spread of viral news are, one is echo chambers. <clears throat> I'm sorry, these are groups highly connected online with one view. And there's often no dissenting opinions that enter into this. So there's a high degree of confirmation bias that exists in these connected communities. For example, they exist in the far right political spectrum and the anti-vaccine community. The issue is confirmation bias and that these groups can slowly be pulled and moved in the direction of becoming more and more extreme over time because it's a <clears throat> because there's an element of, of forward feedback where, where news outlets see that this information is being uptaken really quickly and it's a really popular opinion in a large group of people. So it feeds back to send out more news in that direction. 
So people slowly be, be, become pulled in a more extreme direction over time. One example is how the anti-vaccine movement is slowly being pulled in the direction of anti-science in totality. Another big issue is mainstream media. So the, the one study looked at dietary claims in the top 10 selling newspaper in the UK and found that 72% of the information had insufficient evidence to make their claim. From a COVID perspective, studies have mounting evidence that over social media, um, mainstream media, both accidentally and purposefully has shared misinformation, especially around the COVID vaccines. So let's not forget that mainstream media, which is typically a trusted and verified source, is also an important spreader of misinformation with a very large broadcast audience. Another piece is super sharing. Some accounts have a much broader broadcast and reach, and thus have a far greater propensity to help viral spread. One big example of celebrity account accounts, so efficient is their reach that uh, Fauci and the CDC had done a number of celebrity social media takeovers during the pandemic. Another issue is bots. So these are accounts created with software for the sole purpose of amplifying news. They like and retweet to help specific pieces of, of news become viral. These were highly implicated in the 2016 election. Shown in the graph here are the deleted accounts that were highly, highly active and linked to helping news become viral. So as you can see that most of the, these deleted accounts fall to the far extremes of fake news and extreme bias on the left with a far greater propensity to be right wing. So these were presumably bots as they were deleted right after the election and shared such a volume of tweets that it wouldn't, it wouldn't really be possible for it to be people doing that. <clears throat> there are also algorithms, which is what makes one piece of news more likely to show up in your feed than another person's. Um, so if you start looking into anti-vaccine online, then these algorithms know to send anti-vaccine ads your way. So you get exposed to way more information very quickly. I'll hand it over now to Sujin, who's going to dig into, from a people perspective, who is spreading this misinformation and how it's picked up by people. Amazing. Thanks, Stephanie. So um, what I'm going to talk to you all about is uh, susceptibilities. What are the factors that make us susceptible to misinformation? And one study actually broke this down into three categories, uh, psychological factors, behavioral factors, and demographic factors. And I hope to touch on all of those topics during my, pres during my part of the presentation. Uh, next slide. So uh, one systematic review actually uh, characterized 46 distinct psychological factors that may predict susceptibility to misinformation. They took these 46, uh, 46 um, psychological factors and categorized them into four main categories. And I want to go through those categories with you. You can find them at the bottom right above susceptibility to uh, health misinformation in the, in the diagram in the chart, uh, in the presentation. The first one is the ability to reason accurately. This is when we use prior skills or knowledge to inform our perceptions on information in the media. And uh, so, for example, as someone that may be in the healthcare field or works in a hospital, you may have information about how a virus works. And this is protective against misinformation around the COVID-19 virus. Um, secondly, it's this idea between the contrast of accuracy mediated reasoning, intuitive thinking. So accuracy motivated reasoning really revolves around uh, using analytical and logical pathways to interpret information, whereas intuitive thinking revolves around peripheral cues. Uh, so this could be peripheral cues could include what you see in mainstream media or what your really good friend says. And uh, accuracy motivated reasoning is more protective against misinformation, whereas intuitive thinking is less protective. Uh, next is directionally motivated reasoning. And this is when you have a conclusion based on your own pre-existing point of view. And rather than going in with an open mind, you try to find pieces in the media or pieces in information uh, that uh, support that already preconceived conclusion. And lastly is identity motivated reasoning. And this is when you have some sort of um, identity, such as a political affiliation or being part of a group that informs how you think of um, uh, of a piece of information. This is actually a driver of misinformation. So these are some of the psychological susceptibilities to a misinformation. 
But in terms of demographic factors, the first one I want to touch on is age. Uh, it's well established in the literature that older age means you're more, oh yeah, thank you. Oh, older age is more susceptible to misinformation. So um, if you're, uh, it's been found that if you're greater than 65 years old, you're seven times more likely to share political fake news on Facebook compared to an 18 to 29 year old. And some of the reasons include cognitive declines, social changes, and digital illiteracy. Next, we, uh, we have young age as well. Now, interestingly, during my literature review, I found this less established in the literature, but we do know that children actively use social media, but may have less emotional and cognitive capacity to distinguish reliable and unreliable information. In one survey, they actually found 13 to 17 year olds get a lot of their news from the social media. So 54% of youth get uh, their uh, news from social media, and then 50% get their information from YouTube. And actually 60% of teens get their news from celebrities, influencers, and public personalities. Next, we'll chat a little bit about some of the behavioral factors in relation to our young population. So in, in one of the systematic reviews, they actually categorized various behavioral factors that, um, uh, that may contribute to misinformation. Um, and what they found is that the largest behavioral factor was social media use. And we know that social, that social, media, is, uh, social media is often used by young people. Um, next, we can. Well, I want to touch on um, a, a survey that was put out by the UK 28 Commission on Fake News and Critical Literacy in Schools. And what they found is that only 2% of children actually have the skills to judge whether news is real or fake. And how they did this is they took six news stories, some of them real, some of them fake, and asked a group of school students to actually identify which is real and which is fake. And only 2% uh, of students were able to identify all six stories correctly. And in fact, children from disadvantaged backgrounds had, were more at risk of misinformation. Um, so we know that also children can spread misinformation through social media. And one study actually describes students spreading misinformation due to its perceived value, self-expression, or socialization. So that spreading or sharing of posts is actually a form of social capital. And the way that I interpret that is that it's a way to get popular. And uh, we see that demonstrated in the literature. The next factor is actually education. We know that higher education me, uh, equates to you being less likely to believe misinformation, whereas if you have lower education, you're more likely to believe conspiracies. And this has um, been actually documented in a study where they found people at lower education level actually ha had a higher tendency to believe in conspiracy theories. And this is, this is thought to uh, relate to an interplay between cognitive complexity and feelings of control. After this is um, the next demographic factor is around uh, literacy, around health, technology, and, dig uh, and the digital world. We know that limited literacy is associated with higher rates of trusting resources that are of low quality, such as information from social media and blogs, in contrast, actually uh, trusting information from the healthcare providers. And the idea of literacy is really related to other demographic factors, such as um, education, lower income, and older age. I also want to touch on the concept of the demogra demographic factor of race. Uh, uh, this is grounded in the fact that there have been institutional harms against my marginalized groups in our history by healthcare, and there's an institutional distrust. And what contributes to that is um, how our interactions with race and uh, misinformation um, is uh, handled uh, by our social media. And this is illustrated by uh, one, uh, one survey where they compared fact-checking efforts of misinformation in English language versus um, um, non-English languages. So they found that Facebook actually um, uh, acted upon 26% of fact-checked misinformation in English languages. In contrast, they only acted upon, uh, they, uh, they failed to act upon 56% of uh, misinformation in non-English languages. So there's, an, uh, there's a very clear divide uh, in this. Lastly, I just want to touch on a couple of demographic factors that I'm just going to go over very briefly and not go into too much detail. But uh, the first one is income. They know that lower income is uh, makes you more vulnerable to misinformation. The second is religion. Strong religious beliefs actually uh, relates to retention of misinformation. Uh, we also know that people in urban areas are less susceptible to health misinformation. And... Um, 
for interest, gender is completely mixed. There's no there's no uh, association between gender and misinformation that I could find in the literature. Now, lastly, I want to give uh, an example about um, about uh, misinformation uh, that targeted a specific group. Now, there's a, a documentary called Medical Racism, The New Apartheid. And it's a documentary alleging that COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine is an experiment on African-American um, peoples. And what they did is they anchored this claim on actual institutional acts of racism, such as the Tuskegee syphilis study, and paralleling those institutional acts of racism around COVID-19 vaccines. And this is a, a, an example of where a harm was actually um, uh, acted upon a, a, a group. Now, next, I want to actually go into strategies around uh, misinformation. And we can categorize this into the one and the many. So in terms of the one, this is when a patient, a parent, or a family member comes into your office and has um, uh, you know, speaks about a piece of misinformation. Um, now, I think before we actually uh, move into deal uh, managing that piece of misinformation, it's important to be a little bit introspective. The first point is is that we need to recognize that we live in our own echo chambers as healthcare providers. Um, we're privileged in that we have lots of evidence-based information readily available at our fingertips, and we have the tools and skills to appraise and relay this information. So we are really exposed to one particular perspective um, within healthcare. Now, when a piece of misinformation is presented by a patient, it's really important to avoid the urge to simply attempt to debunk the myth or, uh, or misinformation. Uh, in the same vein, you want to resist one-on-one -on -one debates or targeted correction of a patient's presentation of misinformation. Researchers actually uh, demonstrated that if uh, if a patient is stating something that's um, incorrect, give, saying that it's wrong and just giving a brief explanation is largely effective. Instead, what's more effective is an empathetic collaborative approach um, uh, where you can kind of really understand the patient. Uh, you can gain uh, insight into their values, their health attitudes and information while helping build a really trusting relationship. Moving back to the point of introspection, it's important to acknowledge that you know, dealing and managing with misinformation is challenging. And we need to kind of seek resources to guide our approach to patient conversations. Uh, this is to evaluate our own successful approaches, uh, unsuccessful approaches, um, to broaden our skill set and to address our own advocacy burnout. I think one of the common themes that I saw was that during the pandemic, um, to cha cha dealing with um, uh, misinformation around vaccines did result in a lot of burnout uh, around my colleagues. And it's important to recognize that and then develop an approach on how to manage it. Um, next, I want to uh, talk about, um, you know, patient to patient con uh, con conversations. So to a provider, um, when a patient presents a, a piece of information that might seem outlandish, given the, uh, the scientific evidence refuting them, it's important to appreciate the context. Again, simply mis uh, fighting misinformation has been with just um, re a rebuttal has been pro proven to be largely ineffective and could actually cause more harm than good. But what really helped me try to uh, decipher this is to remember that these beliefs and behaviors are often a sum of mainly two factors. Firstly, personal values that have developed over an entire lifetime that have been consistently reinforced by social norms. It's to transition that frame of thought to, uh, you know, that this is their objective truth and we just have to sort of run with it and then manage it from there. Uh, and then secondly, it's, as we've talked about susceptibilities to um, uh, misinformation, one of the biggest behavioral susceptibilities is social media. And there's constant exposure to convincing yet false or even misleading information on the internet, on online social media networks, or even social leaders. So it's important to recognize that those are the factors that um, uh, contribute to uh, misinformation, but there's also a wealth of evidence-based strategies grounded in social and behavioral sciences that helps us um, uh, guide our conversations and make beneficial health decisions. Um, on the next slide, you can actually see uh, one of these resources that um, are, are available. This is Misinfo RX. This is a, uh, a toolkit provided for um, uh, providers to guide us in, uh, in um, 
uh, managing misinformation related topics when it comes to patients. Uh, this was actually created by several health institutes in the US as a toolkit for providers. And I want to talk, we want to talk about one of the approaches in, um, uh, in this guide. And this is the three C's approach. This is compassion, understanding, connection, and collaboration. And it's a way to guide our conversations with patients. It's a flexible, malleable approach with a set of tools that we can use at our disposal. And it's similar to Kaleidoscope. I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with that uh, this show, but it's a show where you can watch the episodes in any order, and you'll still get the same story at the end of it. And, and this tool is a very much um, the same way. You can use it in any order, use it how how you want and um, you'll get the uh, same um, ending at the end. So the first C uh, is um, compassionate understanding. Um, so we know that direct prescriptive and authoritative approaches don't work and actually can uh, damage the patient uh, physician relationship or patient provider relationship and reduce trust. Instead, we want to apply a bi-directional approach founded on empathy, listening, patience, and this will actually open up opportunities to build trust and really understand our patient. Aim is to uh, the aim is to actually understand how and um, cure them in real time, and this will give us a window of opportunity to actually appreciate what their honest insights and beliefs are. Because if they don't open up about what their honest insights and beliefs are, how can we expect to actually address them in the future? Um, so in terms of the concept of compassionate understanding, we want to facilitate and allow for self-expression and content exploration. And this is an opportunity to learn your patient. As the patient shares their beliefs and misinformations, you want to ask them why they feel this way. And you want to um, uh, ask them why they support or believe this information in contrast to other options. And while listening to that information, one of the things that's actually helpful that was uh, demonstrated in this guide is uh, characterizing patients' motivations uh, for understanding pieces of information. So um, asking questions like, can you teach me about um, um, what your needs or why does X, Y, and Z appeal for you? In a non-judgmental space is uh, helpful or uh, helpful for uh, questions to kind of characterize um, uh, what to listen for. Now, uh, this guide actually categorizes some motivations for patients um, uh, for us. So the first one is cultural characteristics. So for example, if someone's ideologically conservative, they ha may have certain characteristic, uh, cultural characteristics that motivate them um, to uh, believe a piece of misinformation. The second category is individual morals, values, and goals. So this is values taking on actions beneficial to a larger community. And that's another factor that might influence someone's motivations to understand a piece of misinformation. And lastly, it's in-group norms and approved behaviors. This is when you know, there's trust in the opinions of group in group leaders, and they want to uh, believe information that aligns with their social network. So appreciating what characterizes their motivations for misinformation is an, another approach to help understand. The second C is actually connection. So once you have fostered a safe pay place through compassion, you want to seek permission to offer confirmation around the true false presented information. Uh, you want to be open to feedback while doing this, offer what is known and unknown about certain topics, and then examine patient references and offer reputable resources um, uh, afterwards and review these together. The amount of times that I've you know, turned the computer screen towards a patient, read reviewed resources together, or even offer up new resources was, has been an extremely powerful tool in addressing misinformation. And then uh, next, uh, uh, in the last slide, um, we can uh, see collaboration. Uh, that's the last C. And this is when we um, want to think to the future. Uh, you know, I, I hear that it could feel really frustrating when you're trying to manage a piece of misinformation that, com that comes from a patient and feels like it's getting nowhere. But that actually opens up opportunities to build trust and build a follow-up relationship so that you can actually uh, address this piece of misinformation in the future. And maybe if you build a trusting relationship, that patient will feel more comfortable to under uh, pre, uh, to uh, accepting patient, uh, to uh, uh, feel more comfortable accepting clinician expertise uh, on a certain topic. And that just, that just founded on um, a, a foundation of trust and uh, uh, the physician, uh, the clinician patient relationship. 
Um, so, you know, important, it's very important to um, uh, build follow-up uh, uh, follow appointments and have further conversations about that misinformation. Um, and additionally, um, we want to express gratitude for having these discussions. So that's incredibly important. Being open actually takes a bit of courage and then having a, a provider actually express gratitude for that helps build that trust and then uh, builds that collaborative relationship. So that really summarizes the three C's of approach, compassion, connection, and collaboration. Uh, this addresses uh, the one. But now I want to actually pass it on uh, to Victoria, who's going to take us through the landscapes of navigating medical misinformation and how, and she'll say, uh, give us an approach to the many. Thank you, Sujin. So we can approach the one during our clinical encounters with patients, but also with family members and other members of the public, as Sujin uh, explored with the three C's approach. And as we've heard, it can be very daunting to imagine how we as individuals can approach the many given how widespread the use of social media is and how ingrained it is into everybody's daily lives as a constant source of information that may be the truth or misleading, and as we heard, um, may be a source of burnout. So next, we will discuss the barriers and strategies that are in place in both the online and offline worlds to approach the many who may be impacted by misinformation. So in terms of strategies and barriers in the online world, the first thing that we can do um, for our part is to redirect and correctly inform the many by reporting this um, misinformation after identifying it. This information is often produced by a few accounts, as Stephanie had mentioned, that have a widespreading network. However, this does require personal time. It requires health and media literacy, and also the, the presence of the correct technological algorithms to actually flag misinformation in a timely manner. Next, we can approach the many by personally sharing factual information. By hitting the like button on verified and reliable sources, we can actually tip that balance towards factual and evidence-based um, information so that um, this information is becoming more highly viewed, liked, commented on, and sends um, the algorithm in that direction. And if you are actually personally interested in sharing or creating content, using um, you know, our academic and prof professional credentials is a great way to have that public trust um, as we promote credible information online. So using our privilege in that way um, to do the right thing. Lastly, something that um, I was reading about that's more new on public on the um, social media landscape is something called amplifiers on accounts such as Twitter. So these are groups of professionals that have shared knowledge bases that work collabor collaboratively to identify and combat misinformation through comments, posts, videos, and infographics. So this as a group allows for rapid dissemination of factual information. And this is important because studies have shown that up to one in four physicians prior to COVID actually experienced personal attacks over social media and after COVID, up to 60% of scientists who were independently commenting or posting in response to COVID-related misinformation type content were being personally attacked over social media. So this amplifier group sort of is like a, like a protective factor. Um, and overall, as you can see, there are individual ways, but also group approaches um, in the online world that are developing. Next slide. Good. So this is just um, one resource I wanted to share to start, um, as well as another. Um, so the WHO has excellent information about how to report misinformation across various social media platforms. This is what you see in the blue, blue screen. Um, and each, each social media, there's a different um, pathway, but just to know that there are resources that do exist. And then just to share um, a source that I think is excellent in terms of providing credible evidence-based information in a readily shareable format is this Science Up First website. Um, it specifically targets common misconceptions in health and science, explains to readers why it's misinformation, why it's false, and gives a clear explanation as well as references. Um, and just to mention, so as Sujin had explored, there are many gaps in these efforts, just as we think about what who the vulnerable populations are to misinformation. And although this is a great website, I did notice that it's only translated in English and French. So unless, um, and, and, and as well, unless these resources are shared outside our own echo chambers and health, then, you know, is this gonna be reaching the populations that need it most? Next slide. So in terms of offline, are we ever? 
So strategies and barriers there are, um, there's, there's quite a few. So although most sources of misinformation are originating online, our presence offline can have a major impact. So on the individual level, as we've explored those trusted conversations with healthcare providers or just people who recognize misinformation is important. Um, and unfortunately, as we know in the current scape of our um, healthcare system, around 15% of Canadians age 12 and older, which is about 4.6 million people as of 2019, just did not have that consecutive primary care provider that they could talk to if they need health advice. So this creates a serious gap for patients and families to fall through the, tra the, the cracks for those trusting relationships and to have those conversations about where they receive their medical information on the first and subsequent visits. There's also quite a few public health organizations, notably the WHO and UNICEF that have identified misinformation as a major threat to global public health. Um, and there's many different um, approaches at the moment. So this is including partnerships with local and global health agencies, tech and media companies, and the governments uh, and uh, different governments around the world to address online misinformation. So one example that we may have all seen is um, on social media, you may see a banner that pops up if there's a post made about, for example, the COVID vaccine, and it will help um, kick into an algorithm that will redirect you then to a more reliable, credible source. Um, so this is an example of, of that type of initiative. As well, the government, um, government actions in, is involving funding for national and community-based literacy programs and media, helping to address some of those disparities, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, and then, um, although there were discussions on a government level about actual criminalization of creating and spreading disinformation, specific policies don't yet exist in this area. Um, and the argument is that it may be an infringement of public of, of freedom of speech, um, as well as the actual spread of credible information that isn't yet verified between scientists. So um, there's just discussion in this, in this area at the moment, but overall the decision to identify what is true does not fall into the hands of the government. Um, so next slide. This is an example of um, an excerpt from one of the WHO websites. So as I mentioned, um, the WHO has a call for action against this infodemic um, just to help you know, restore public order and safety. Uh, this is including advocacy to access to credible information, building resilience against misinformation globally, and understanding the scale of the infodemic and strategies. So this is an interesting tool that I came across. It's called social media listening, and it allows for the collection of public concerns um, that are being posted on social media. So this is being picked up um, by this tool. <laughs> Someone drawing. <laughs> Um, it's being picked up by this tool uh, to fill in, and, and then this information is used to fill in the voids that maybe exist in the social media realm um, and to fill those with credible information from trusted sources before misinformation and posts in that area go viral. So it's kind of a, um, like a proactive approach that I, I've seen um, in development. Next slide, please. And then um, just another resource I wanted to share, there's actually a very nice um, uh, a document released by the Government of Canada that's outlining research and policy opportunities against misinformation in Canada, highlighting again the role of the individual, the organizations and government levels to address this. Um, it reiterates again that this government led moderation of social media and digital platforms should be avoided, but rather funding should be directed into the development of algorithms um, and, and, and groups separate uh, or independent groups that are combating misinformation. However, of course, there should be transparency in these practices. I think we all wanna know what kind of algorithms are going, occurring through our phones, um, and this will allow auditing as well as future research opportunities. Um, and an example I came across, and I shared an excerpt of those across the bottom of the screen, there's um, this social media lab in uh, the Toronto Metropolitan University. So it's, it's being funded um, with a diversity of projects that um, are, some of the, which are in collaboration with, with the WHO to help facilitate some of these fact checking initiatives and um, kind of tipping again the balance towards the spread of true and credible information um, by understanding what misinformation may be brewing on social media. And then the last slide for me. So lastly, what are the things we can do in the future to help combat misinformation? I think the number one thing is education. Education is 
is key. And um, I shared a couple of fun resources that are directed at kids specifically. There's a website called teachingkidsnews.com, as well as some quirky books that are just about spotting misinformation. And this website includes online games. So it just is a, you know, one way that we can begin to share, um, you know, fun ways to learn about combating misinformation with patients, kids, and families. Um, hopefully we can, you know, begin to think critically about misinformation, personally identify it, and hopefully stop it in its tracks. Um, and then next, as an educational institution, such as the University of Ottawa, we do have the opportunity and the need to start integrating sessions into our medical curriculum, teaching medical students, perhaps residents, about communication and science, uh, recognizing misinformation in medicine, and as well, perhaps using social media platforms to continue to promote reliable and credible based um, resources to patients and families. I will say that some medical schools in the United States uh, I've, I've seen uh, have actually included similar courses that combat this um, into their curriculum. As well, as always, attending presentations like Grand Rounds, this is a great opportunity to, again, educate ourselves about misinformation and strategies we can personally implement into our professional lives. Um, and I also, just in my searching, have noticed that there are some CME courses that were popping up in the states in this area, but I haven't come across any in particular in Canada yet. And although it can be exhausting to face the many, as well as even the one in our clinical encounters, this battle against misinformation is so important. Um, and so really anything that we can do to develop these trusted resources, whether it's providing or explaining a handout as Sujin had mentioned, or making posts over our institution's social media platform, um, or any other creative way, really any effort counts. So just to move on to the summary slide. So misinformation is false information as we learn that depending on the form may cause varying degrees of harm to an individual as well as society. Medical information is common and has significantly been associated with morbidity and mortality, particularly as we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are various demographic, behavioral, psychological factors that makes society susceptible to misinformation as Sujin explored. And the approach to the one and the many involves compassion, connection, and collaboration, both from the individual to government levels. And so the threat of misinformation has always been present. It's certainly grown over the last few years with the COVID-19 pandemic. And Unfortunately, this probably isn't going to be the last time that we face a healthcare crisis where misinformation is threatening public health, safety, and security, but we can all play a, a role in the fight against misinformation, and that is a fact. Um, so moving on to our last slide, um, I just wanted to ask uh, or say thank you for joining our grand rounds this morning, and we welcome any questions and discussion. Um, thank you very much, and we've also shared our resource, our references at the end. Thank you so much for the uh, very interesting and timely presentation on the just past the one year anniversary of the uh, Ottawa protests. Um, I see that uh, Dr. Hajinakis has a question. Hi, <laughs> I wanted to thank you very, very much for a great presentation. I really, uh, I really loved um, your outline of the approach to the one and the many. I thought that was really so, so well done. I also wanted to just put in a plug. I know that social media gets a lot of uh, negative attention. Um, at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge that places like Twitter uh, were really birthplaces for rights movements such as Black Lives Matter, I don't know more, um, also rights movements across the world. So we want to... Um, make sure we take a balanced approach to the way we sort of think about social media and not be so hands off. So I would support, I would support um, people like us maybe engaging in social media a little bit more instead of sort of being super critical of it all the time. Um, and that might make the space a bit, a bit more, um, a bit more balance, sort of coming down into the public square a bit more rather than sort of staying in our in our towers, I think. Uh, and I think you guys outlined that really nicely. Um, I think I think we can be scared to kind of enter that ring because of some of the vitriol that kind of flies, flies there. But um, I think it may be a mistake for us to kind of avoid it. Um, and then I, I was just wondering how we would, how, what you guys would recommend in terms, you talked a little bit about medical education. 
Um, any other barriers that you see? Like I was thinking about just paywalls around journal articles and how we sort of um, pr protect me medical information, maybe overprotect medical information is not as readily available. I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, especially when students talking about the demographic factors, how how unreachable new medical information is to the public. So articles, I've seen some articles and a handful of them with a plain language summary, but very few articles and very few journals are asking for like a two to three sentence plain language summary of their findings. And I think that that would be a really powerful tool as well. So that as people are reading abstracts or if people wanted to read abstracts, um, it would give them a, a, a two or three liner Here's the bottom line in regular English and the, the take home point for the average Canadian um, that I think could, could also be a powerful tool and a way for us to help disseminate some of that information. Yeah, I just wanted to add as well, like, I mean, I think it, journal articles may not always be the most accessible way for people to get information. So that's why I really love seeing like the infographics, these fun websites that really condense and, and um, kind of share information in a fun way that I think is a bit more um, like a, just better for, you know, the lay public. So um, that's why one of the things I came across was in medical schools, actually, not just like about, you know, sharing resources, but how can we convert it into a way that's um, accessible to the public. So um, yeah, that's, I think, an interesting thing to consider incorporating in the future. And, and so I think the Marcus, other- I see so Dr. Huey has oh. his hand up there. Sure. I'm happy to go after Susan. <clears throat> no, no, it's all good. You go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think it's really important to engage um, uh, in discussion, but I, I also think it's important to clearly uh, engage in the understanding of science and, and what we know and what we don't know, and uh, don't be too dogmatic associated with it, but also to educate uh, people about what science is because there really is this misperception associated with what you can get out of science like can we say 100 percent sure that um, such a thing is is true never never but so people take that idea that you're unable to 100 percent say uh, um, that something is is that way and say well there is some doubt in there but that is science right so um so but but people don't understand that. And, and it talks to the health literacy, but also kind of science literacy out there. Thank you very much. Thanks. I see a comment from Dr. Zucker or a question. Yeah, I was just going to um, ask, you know, um, opinions of the of the panel, you know, paper today reports that over 2 million Ontarians do not have a primary care provider. And we're seeing increasing numbers of people in our community who don't have access. You know, and you speak a lot to the relationships that you need to build and have with with patients to talk about these topics and whether or not, you know, there's any further information that you've seen or gathered on the impact of lack of access to primary care and whether or not that's driving people's uh, turning to alternate forms of health information. Um, and 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 driving this misinformation uh, problem. I mean, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head just in terms of this definitely being a driver of, you know, at least part of the problem. I don't think that these conversations and relationships are necessarily just isolated to primary care. Um, even at CHEO, I mean, we all have examples of patients who have been admitted, you know, potentially for several weeks, um, patients who followed, you know, long-term longitudinally by pediatrics as an outpatient. So certainly I think, you know, the longitudinal care relationships exist outside of family medicine. Um, but certainly individuals not having access to a primary care provider is, is going to fuel looking for health information online even more so than, than it potentially would if you had regular follow-up with someone who could have these discussions with you. And I think there, there is a lot of benefit. Oh. 
sorry, go ahead, Sujin. Oh, no, I think there is a lot of benefit in uh, having a primary care provider. Um, agree with Rachel's point that it's not exclusive to uh, primary care, but I just want to highlight the, that relationship with demographic factors. We know that certain populations or certain groups are, have less access to care and have less access to a primary care provider. Um, so that's just another example of how some groups could be disadvantaged uh, from a misinformation perspective. Well, we're at time. Thank you so much for the very thought provoking presentation, as well as um, the interesting discussion. There's some great comments there in the chat, including Dr. Fempui shared uh, an upcoming um, event. Um, so if people want to have a look, and you'll also note that the evaluation survey is there for you to complete. Thank you so much to our pres presenter group for the terrific uh, presentation and to everybody attending today. Have a wonderful Wednesday.